Hello everyone, I am back again with more Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and uh, hopefully this time actually with sound. <laughs> this is the same section that I uh, read through last night, um, but obviously didn't have sound. Uh, I have uh, fixed the issue, I'm using a different browser, and um, I have updated the uh, offending browsers so that uh, I will actually have the sound this time. So, um, we're going to just hop straight into it because uh, I have to read the whole section over again that I read last night. And uh, so, uh, I hope everybody's ready and uh, ready for this next section here. All right. So, where we left off, um, Arthur and Ford escaped the destruction of the Earth in um, the uh, Vogon constructor ship that was destroying the Earth. Uh, because uh, they uh, hitched a ride thanks to Ford's dumb. And um, now they are uh, about to be ejected into space. So we'll have to see what happens there. Alrighty, here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 8. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a wholly remarkable book. It has been compiled and recompiled many times over many years and under many different editorships. It contains contributions from countless numbers of travelers and researchers. The introduction begins like this. Space, it says, is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Listen, and so on. After a while, the style settles down a bit, and he begins to tell you things you really need to know, like the fact that the fabulously beautiful planet Beth Salomon is now so worried about the cumulative erosion by 10 billion visiting tourists a year that any net imbalance between the amount you eat and the amount you excrete while on the planet is surgically removed from your body weight when you leave. So every time you go to the lavatory there, it is vitally important to get a receipt. To be fair, though, when confronted by the sheer enormity of the distances between the stars, Better minds than the one responsible for the guide's introduction have faltered. Some invite you to consider for a moment a peanut in Reading and a small walnut in Johannesburg and other such dizzying options. The simple truth is that interstellar distances will not fit into the human imagination. Even light, which travels so fast that it takes most races thousands of years to realize that it travels at all, takes time to journey between the stars. It takes eight minutes to journey from the star Sol to the place where the Earth used to be, and four years more to arrive at Sol's nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Proxima. For light to reach the other side of the galaxy, for it to reach Damagran, for instance, takes rather longer. 500,000 years. The record for hitchhiking this distance is just under five years, but you don't get to see much on the way. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says that if you hold a lung full of air, you can survive in the total vacuum of space for about 30 seconds. However, it does go on to say that what with space being the mind-boggling size it is, the chances of getting picked up by another ship within those 30 seconds are 2 to the power of 276,709 to 1 against. By a totally staggering coincidence, that is also the telephone number of an Islington flat where Arthur once went to a very good party and met a very nice girl whom he totally failed to get off with. She went off with a gatecrasher. Though the planet Earth, the Islington Flat, and the Telephone have all now been demolished, it is comforting to reflect that they are all in some small way commemorated by the fact that 29 seconds later, Ford and Arthur were rescued. Chapter 9 A computer chattered to itself in alarm as it noticed an airlock open and close itself for no apparent reason. This was because reason was in fact out to lunch. A hole had just appeared in the galaxy. It was exactly a nothingth of a second long, a nothingth of an inch wide, and quite a lot of millions of light years from end to end. As it closed up, lots of paper hats and party balloons fell out of it and drifted off through the universe. A team of seven three-foot-high market analysts fell out of it and died, partly of asphyxiation, partly of surprise. 239,000 lightly fried eggs fell out of it, too, materializing in a large wobbly heap on the famine-struck land of Pogrel and the Pancel system. The whole Pogrel tribe had died out from famine, except for one last man who died of cholesterol poisoning some weeks later. The nothingth of a second for which the whole existed reverberated backward and forward through time in a most improbable fashion. 
Somewhere in the deeply remote past, it seriously traumatized a small random group of atoms drifting through the empty sterility of space and made them cling together in the most extraordinarily unlikely patterns. These patterns quickly learned to copy themselves. This was part of what was so extraordinary about the patterns and went on to cause massive trouble on every planet they drifted onto. That was how life began in the universe. Five wild event maelstroms swirled in vicious storms of unreason and spewed up a pavement. On the pavement lay Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent, gulping like half-spent fish. Oh, there you are, gasped Ford, scrabbling for a finger hold on the pavement as it reached through the third reach of the unknown. I told you I'd think of something. Oh, sure, said Arthur. Sure. Bright idea of mine, said Ford, to find a passing spaceship and get rescued by it. The real universe arched sickeningly away beneath them. Various pretend ones flitted silently by like mountain goats. Primal light exploded, splattering space-time as with gobbets of jello. Time blossomed, matter shrank away. The highest prime number coalesced quietly in a corner and hid itself away forever. Oh, come off it, said Arthur. The chances against it were astronomical. Don't knock it, it worked, said Ford. What sort of ship are we in? asked Arthur as the pit of eternity yawned beneath them. I don't know, said Ford. I haven't opened my eyes yet. No, nor have I, said Arthur. The universe jumped, froze, quivered, and splayed out in several unexpected directions. Arthur and Ford opened their eyes and looked about in considerable surprise. Good God, said Arthur. It looks just like the seafront at South End. Hell, I'm relieved to hear you say that, said Ford. Why? Because I thought I must be going mad. Perhaps you are. Perhaps you only thought I said it. Ford thought about this. Well, did you say it or didn't you? He asked. I think so, said Arthur. Well, perhaps we're both going mad. Yes, said Arthur. We'd be mad, all things considered, to think this was South End. Well, do you think this is South End? Oh, yes. So do I. Therefore, we must be mad. Nice day for it. Yes, said a passing maniac. Who was that? asked Arthur. Who, the man with the five heads and the elderberry bush full of kippers? Yes. I don't know, just someone. Ah. They both sat on the pavement and watched with a certain unease as huge children bounced heavily along the sand and wild horses thundered through the sky, taking fresh supplies of reinforced railings to the uncertain areas. You know, said Arthur with a slight cough, if this is South End, there's something very odd about it. You mean the way the sea stays steady as a rock and the buildings keep washing up and down? said Ford. Yes, I thought that was odd, too. In fact, he continued as with a huge bang, South End split itself into six equal segments, which danced and spun giddily round each other in lewd and licentious formations. There is something altogether very strange going on. Wild yowling noises of pipes and strings seared through the wind. Hot donuts popped out of the road for ten pence each. Horrid fish stormed out of the sky, and Arthur and Ford decided to make a run for it. They plunged through heavy walls of sound, mountains of archaic thought, valleys of mood music, bad shoe sessions, and footling bats, and suddenly heard a girl's voice. It sounded quite a sensible voice, but it just said, Two to the power of one hundred thousand to one against and falling, and that was all. Ford skidded down a beam of light and spun round trying to find a source for the voice, but could see nothing he could seriously believe in. What was that voice? shouted Arthur. I don't know, yelled Ford. I don't know. It sounded like a measurement of probability. Probability? What do you mean? Probability, you know, like two to one, three to one, five to four against. It said two to the power of one hundred thousand to one against. That's pretty improbable, you know. A million gallon vat of custard upended itself over them without warning. But what does it mean? cried Arthur. What, the custard? No, the measurement of improbability. I don't know. I don't know at all. I think we're on some kind of spaceship. I can only assume, said Arthur, that this is not the first class compartment. Bulges appeared in the fabric of space time. Great, ugly bulges. <sighs> said Arthur as he felt his body softening and bending in unusual directions. South End seems to be melting away. The stars are swirling in a dust bowl. My legs are drifting off into the sunset. My left arm's come off too. A frightening thought struck him. Hell, he said. How am I going to operate my digital watch now? He wound his eyes desperately around in Ford's direction. Ford, he said. 
You're turning into a penguin. Stop it. Again came the voice. Two to the power of 75,000 to one against and falling. Ford waddled around the pond in a furious circle. Hey, who are you? He quacked. Where are you? What's going on? And is there any way of stopping it? Please relax, said the voice pleasantly, like a stewardess on an airliner with only one wing and two engines, one of which is on fire. You are perfectly safe. But that's not the point, raged Ford. The point is that I am now a perfectly safe penguin, and my colleague here is rapidly running out of limbs. It's all right, I've got them back now, said Arthur. Two to the power of fifty thousand to one against, and falling, said the voice. Admittedly, said Arthur, they're longer than I usually like them, but... Isn't there anything? squawked Ford in avian fury. You feel you ought to be telling us? The voice cleared its throat. A giant petit four lolloped off into the distance. Welcome, the voice said, to the starship Heart of Gold. The voice continued. Please do not be alarmed, it said, by anything you see or hear around you. You are bound to feel some initial ill effects as you have been rescued from certain death at an improbability level of two to the power of 276,000 to one against, possibly much higher. We are now cruising at a level of two to the power of 25,000 to one against and falling, and we will be restoring normality just as soon as we are sure what is normal anyway. Thank you. Two to the power of 20,000 to one against and falling. The voice cut out. Ford and Arthur were in a small luminous pink cubicle. Ford was wildly excited. Arthur, he said. This is fantastic! We've been picked up by a ship powered by the infinite improbability drive! This is incredible! I heard rumors about it before. They were all officially denied, but they must have done it! They built the improbability drive! Arthur, this is... Arthur? What's happening? Arthur had jammed himself in against the door to the cubicle, trying to hold it closed, but it was ill-fitting. Tiny, furry little hands were squeezing themselves through the cracks, their fingers were ink-stained. Tiny voices chattered insanely. Arthur looked up. Ford, he said. There's an infinite number of monkeys outside who want to talk to us about this script for Hamlet they've worked out. And that brings us to chapter 10. The infinite improbability drive is a wonderful new method of crossing vast interstellar distances in a mere nothing of a second, without all that tedious mucking about in hyperspace. It was discovered by a lucky chance and then developed into a governable form of propulsion by the Galactic Government's research team on Damagran. This, briefly, is the story of its discovery. The principle of generating small amounts of finite improbability by simply hooking the logic circuits of a Bambleweenie 57 submason brain to an atomic vector plotter suspended in a strong Brownian motion producer, say a nice hot cup of tea, were of course well understood and such generators were often used to break the ice at parties by making all the molecules in the hostess's undergarments leap simultaneously one foot to the left, in accordance with the theory of indeterminacy. Many respectable physicists said they weren't going to stand for this, partly because it was a debasement of science, but mostly because they didn't get invited to those sorts of parties. Another thing they couldn't stand was the perpetual failure they encountered in trying to construct a machine which could generate the infinite improbability field needed to flip a spaceship across the mind-paralyzing distances between the farthest stars, and in the end they grumpily announced that such a machine was virtually impossible. Then one day, a student who had been left to sweep up the lab after a particularly unsuccessful party found himself reasoning this way. If, he thought to himself, such a machine is a virtual impossibility, then it must logically be a finite improbability. So all I have to do in order to make one is to work out exactly how improbable it is, feed that figure into the finite improbability generator, give it a fresh cup of really hot tea, and turn it on. He did this, and was rather startled to discover that he had managed to create the long-sought-after golden infinite improbability generator out of thin air. It startled him even more when, just after he was awarded the Galactic Institute's prize for extreme cleverness, he got lynched by a rampaging mob of respectable physicists who had finally realized that the one thing they really couldn't stand was a smartass. And that takes us into Chapter 11. The improbability-proof control cabin of the Heart of Gold looked like a perfectly conventional spaceship, except that it was perfectly clean because it was so new. Some of the control seats hadn't had the plastic wrapping taken off yet. The cabin was mostly white, oblong, and about the size of a smallish restaurant. 
In fact, it wasn't perfectly oblong. The two long walls were raked round in a slight parallel curve, and all the angles and corners of the cabin were contoured in excitingly chunky shapes. The truth of the matter is that it would have been a great deal simpler and more practical to build the cabin as an ordinary three-dimensional oblong room, but then the designers would have got miserable. As it was, the, ca the cabin looked excitingly purposeful, with large video screens ranged over the control and guidance system panels on the concave wall, and long banks of computers set into the convex wall. In one corner, a robot sat humped, its gleaming brushed steel head hanging loosely between its gleaming brushed steel knees. It too was fairly new, but though it was beautifully constructed and polished, it somehow looked as if the various parts of its more or less humanoid body didn't quite fit properly. In fact, they fitted perfectly well, but something in its bearing suggested that they might have fitted better. Zaphod Beeblebrox paced nervously up and down the cabin, brushing his hands over pieces of gleaming equipment and giggling with excitement. Trillian sat hunched over a clump of instruments reading off figures. Her voice was carried round the Tenoy system of the whole ship. Five to one against and falling, she said. Four to one against and falling. Three to one. Two. One. Probability factor of one to one. We have normality. I repeat, we have normality. She turned her microphone off, then turned it back on with a slight smile and continued. Anything you still can't cope with is therefore your own problem. Please relax, you will be sent for soon. Zaphod burst out in annoyance. Who are they, Trillian? Trillian spun her seat round to face him and shrugged. Just a couple of guys we seem to have picked up in open space, she said. Section ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Yeah, well, it's a very sweet thought, Trillian, complained Zaphod. But do you really think it's wise under the circumstances? I mean, here we are on the run and everything. We must have the police of half the galaxy after us by now. And we stopped to pick up some hitchhikers. Okay, so ten out of ten for style, but minus several million for good thinking, yeah? He tapped irritably at a control panel. Trillian quietly moved his hand before he tapped anything important. Whatever Zaphod's qualities of mind might include, dash, bravado, conceit, he was mechanically inept and could easily blow the ship up with an extravagant gesture. Trillian had come to suspect that the main reason he had such a wild and successful life was that he never really understood the significance of anything he did. Zaphod, she said patiently, they were floating unprotected in open space. You wouldn't want them to have died, would you? Well, you know, no, not as such, but... Not as such, not die as such. But, Trillian cocked her head to one side. Well, maybe someone might have picked him up later. A second later and they would have been dead. Yeah, so if you'd taken the trouble to think about the problem a bit longer, it would have gone away. You'd have been happy to let them die. Well, you know, not happy as such, but... Anyway, said Trillian, turning back to the controls, I didn't pick them up. What do you mean? Who picked them up then? The ship did. Huh? The ship did, all by itself. Huh? While we were in the improbability drive. But that's incredible. No, Zaphod, just very, very improbable. Uh, yeah. Look, Zaphod, she said, patting his arm. Don't worry about the aliens. They're just a couple of guys, I expect. I'll send the robot down to get them and bring them up here. Hey, Marvin! In the corner, the robot's head swung up sharply, but then wobbled about imperceptibly. It pulled itself up to its feet, as if it was about five pounds heavier than it actually was, and what made an outside observer would have thought was a heroic effort to cross the room. It stopped in front of Trillian and seemed to stare through her left shoulder. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed, it said. Its voice was low and hopeless. Oh, God, muttered Zaphod and slumped into a seat. Well said Trillian in a bright, compassionate tone. Here's something to occupy you and keep your mind off things. It won't work, droned Marvin. I have an exceptionally large mind. Marvin, warned Trillian. All right, said Marvin. What do you want me to do? Go down to number two entry bay and bring the two aliens up here under surveillance. With a microsecond pause and a finely calculated micromodulation of pitch and timbre, nothing you could actually take offense at, Marvin managed to convey his utter contempt and horror of all things human. Just that, he said. 
Yes, said Trillian firmly. I won't enjoy it, said Marvin. Zapod leaped out of his seat. She's not asking you to enjoy it, he shouted. Just do it, will ya? All right, said Marvin, like the tolling of a great cracked bell. I'll do it. Good, snapped Zaphod. Great, thank you. Marvin turned and lifted his flat-topped triangular red eyes up toward him. I'm not getting you down at all, am I? He said pathetically. No, no, Marvin, lilted Trillian. That's just fine, really. I wouldn't like to think I was getting you down. No, don't worry about that, the lilt continued. You just act as comes naturally and everything will be just fine. You're sure you won't mind, probed Marvin. No, no, Marvin, lilted Trillian. That's just fine, really, just part of life. Marvin flashed her an electronic look. Life, said Marvin. Don't talk to me about life. He turned hopelessly on his heel and lugged himself out of the cabin. With a satisfied hum and a click, the door closed behind him. I don't think I can stand that robot much longer, Zay thought, growled Trillian. The Encyclopedia Galactica defines a robot as a mechanical apparatus designed to do the work of a man. The marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation defines a robot as your plastic pal who's fun to be with. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy defines the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation as a bunch of mindless jerks who will be the first against the wall re when the revolution comes, with a footnote to the effect that the editors would welcome applications from anyone interested in taking over the post of robotics correspondent. Curiously enough, an edition of the Encyclopedia Galactica that had the good fortune to fall through a time warp from a thousand years in the future defined the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation as a bunch of mindless jerks who were the first against the wall when the revolution came. The pink cubicle had winked out of existence. The monkeys had sunk away to a better dimension. Ford and Arthur found themselves in the embarkation area of the ship. It was rather smart. I think the ship's brand new, said Ford. How can you tell? asked Arthur. Have you got some exotic device for measuring the age of metal? No, I just found this sales brochure lying on the floor. It's a lot of the universe can be yours stuff. Ah! Look, I was right. Ford jabbed at one of the pages and showed it to Arthur. It says, sensational new breakthrough in improbability physics. As soon as the ship's drive reaches infinite improbability, it passes through every point in the universe. Be the envy of other major governments. Wow, this is big league stuff. Ford hunted excitedly through the technical specs of the ship, occasionally gasping with astonishment at what he had read. Clearly, galactic astrotechnology had moved ahead during the years of his exile. Arthur listened for a short while, but being unable to understand the vast majority of what Ford was saying, he began to let his mind wander, trailing his fingers along the edge of an incomprehensible computer bank. He reached out and pressed an invitingly large red button on a nearby panel. The panel lit up with the words, Please do not press this button again. He shook himself. Listen, said Ford, who was still engrossed in the sales brochure. They make a big thing of the ship's cybernetics, a new generation of serious cybernetics corporation robots and computers with the new GPP feature. GPP feature, said Arthur. What's that? Oh, it says genuine people personalities. Oh, said Arthur. Sounds ghastly. A voice behind them said, it is. The voice was low and hopeless and accompanied by a slight clanking sound. They spun round and saw an abject steel man standing hunched in the doorway. What? they said. Ghastly, continued Marvin. It all is absolutely ghastly. Just don't even talk about it. Look at this door, he said, stepping through it. The irony circuits cut into his voice modulator as he mimicked the style of the sales brochure. All the doors in this spaceship have a cheerful and sunny disposition. It is their pleasure to open for you and their satisfaction to close again with the knowledge of a job well done. As the door closed behind them, it became apparent that it did indeed have a satisfied sigh-like quality to it. Hmm, it said. Marvin regarded it with cold loathing while his logic circuits chattered with disgust and tinkered with the concept of directing physical violence against it. Further circuits cut in saying, why bother? What's the point? Nothing is worth getting involved in. 
Further circuits amuse themselves by analyzing the molecular components of the door and of the humanoid's brain cells. For a quick encore, they measure the level of hydrogen emissions in the surrounding cubic parsec of space, and then shut down again in boredom. A spasm of despair shook the robot's body as he turned. Come on, he droned. I've been ordered to take you down to the bridge. Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they ask me to take you down to the bridge. Call that job satisfaction, because I don't. He turned and walked back to the hated door. Uh, excuse me, said Ford, falling after him. Which government owns this ship? Marvin ignored him. You watch this door, he muttered. It's about to open again. I can tell by the intolerable air of smugness it suddenly generates. With an ingratiating little whine, the door slid open again and Marvin stomped through. Come on, he said. The others followed quickly and the door slid back into place with pleased little clicks and whirs. Thank you to the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, said Marvin, and trudged desolately up the gleaming curved corridor that stretched out before them. Let's build robots with genuine people personalities, they said. So they tried it out with me. I'm a personality prototype. You can tell, can't you? Ford and Arthur muttered embarrassed little disclaimers. I hate that door, continued Marvin. I'm not getting you down at all, am I? Which government started Ford again? No government owns it, snapped the robot. It's been stolen. Stolen? Stolen, mimicked Marvin. Who by? asked Ford. Zaphod Beeblebrox. Something extraordinary happened to Ford's face. At least five entirely separate and distinct expressions of shock and amazement piled up on it in a jumbled mess. His left leg, which was in mid-stride, seemed to have difficulty in finding the floor again. He stared at the robot and tried to disentangle some dartoid muscles. Zaphod Beeblebrox, he said weakly. Sorry, did I say something wrong? said Marvin, dragging himself on regardless. Pardon me for breathing, which I never do anyway, so I don't know why I bother to say it. Oh, God, I'm so depressed. Here's another of those self-satisfied doors. Life. Don't talk to me about life. No one even mentioned it, muttered Arthur irritably. Ford, are you all right? Ford stared at him. Did that robot say Zaphod Beeblebrox? He said. And that takes us into chapter 12, which will be our last chapter for today. Here we go. A loud clatter of gunk music flooded through the heart of Gold Cabin as Zaphod searched the sub ether radio wave bands for news of himself. The machine was rather difficult to operate. For years, radios had been operated by means of pressing buttons and turning dials. Then, as the technology became more sophisticated, the controls were made touch-sensitive. You merely had to brush the panels with your fingers. Now all you had to do was wave your hand in the general direction of the components and hope. It saved a lot of muscular expenditure, of course, but it meant that you had to sit infuriatingly still if you wanted to keep listening to the same program. Zaphod waved a hand, and the channel switched again. More gunk music, but this time it was a background to a news announcement. The news was always heavily edited to fit the rhythms of the music. And news reports brought to you here on the sub Ether Wave Band, broadcasting around the galaxy, around the clock. Squawked a voice. And we'll be saying a big hello to all intelligent life forms everywhere. And everyone else out there, the secret is to bang the rocks together, guys. And of course, the big news story tonight is the sensational theft of the new improbability drive prototype ship, by none other than Galactic President Zaphod Beeblebrox. And the question everyone's asking is, has the Big Z finally flipped? Beeblebrox, the man who invented the pan-galactic gargle blaster, ex-confidence trickster, once described by Eccentrica Gallimbits as the best bang since the big one, and recently voted the worst-dressed sentient being in the known universe for the seventh time. Has he got an answer to this? We asked his private brain care specialist, Gag Halfront. The music swirled and dived for a moment. Another voice spoke in, broke in, presumably Halfront. He said, Well, Zephod's just this guy, you know. But he got no further because an electric pencil flew across the cabin and through the radio's on-off sensitive airspace. Zephod turned and glared at Trillian. She had thrown the pencil. 
Hey, he said. What'd you do that for? Trillian was tapping her finger on a screen full of figures. I've just thought of something, she said. Yeah? Worth interrupting a news bulletin about me for? You hear enough about yourself as it is. I'm very insecure, we know that. Can we drop your ego for a moment? This is important. If there's anything more important than my ego around, I want it caught and shot now. Zaphod glared at her again, then laughed. Listen, she said. We picked up those couple of guys. What couple of guys? The couple of guys we picked up. Oh yeah, said Zaphod. Those couple of guys. We picked them up in sector ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Yeah, said Zaphod, and blinked. Trillian said quietly, Does that mean anything to you? Hmm, said Zaphod. ZZ9, plural Z Alpha, ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Well, said Trillian. Uh, what does the Z mean, said Zaphod. Which one? Anyone. One of the major difficulties Trillian experienced in her relationship with Zaphod was learning to distinguish between him pretending to be stupid just to get people off their guard, pretending to be stupid because he couldn't be bothered to think and wanted someone else to do it for him, pretending to be outrageously stupid to hide the fact that he actually didn't understand what was going on, and really being genuinely stupid. He was renowned for being amazingly clever, and quite clearly was so, but not all the time, which obviously worried him, hence the act. He preferred people to be puzzled rather than contemptuous. This, above all, appeared to Trillian to be genuinely stupid, but she could no longer be bothered to argue about it. She sighed and punched up a star map on the, vi on the visa screen so she could make it simple for him, whatever his reasons for wanting it to be that way. There, she pointed. Right there. Hey. Yeah, said Zaphod. Well, she said. Well, what? Parts of the inside of her head screamed at other parts of the inside of her head. She said, very calmly, It's the same sector you originally picked me up in. He looked at her and then looked back at the screen. Hey, yeah, he said. Now that is wild. We should have zapped straight into the middle of the Horsehead Nebula. How would we come to be there? I mean, that's nowhere. She ignored this. Improbability drive, she said patiently. You explained it to me yourself. We pass through every point in the universe. You know that. Yeah, but that's one wild coincidence, isn't it? Yes. Picking someone up at that point? Out of the whole of the universe to choose from. That's just too... I want to work this out. Computer! The serious cybernetic shipboard computer, which controlled and permeated every particle of the ship, switched into communication mode. Hi there! It said brightly and simultaneously spewed out a tiny ribbon of ticker tape just for the record. The ticker tape said, Hi there! Oh, God, said Zaphod. He hadn't worked with this computer for long, but had already learned to loathe it. The computer continued, brash and cheery as if it were selling detergent. I want you to know that whatever your problem, I am here to help you solve it. Yeah, yeah, said Zaphod. Look, I think I'll just use a piece of paper. Sure thing, said the computer, spilling out its message into a waste bin at the same time. I understand. If you ever want, shut up, said Zaphod. And snatching up a pencil, sat down next to Trillian at the console. Okay, okay, said the computer in a hurt tone of voice, and closed down its speech channel again. Zaphod and Trillian poured over the figures that the improbability flight path scanner flashed silently up in front of them. Can we work out, said Zaphod. From their point of view, what the improbability of their rescue was? Yes, that's a constant, said Trillian. Two to the power of 276,709 to one against. That's high. That's high. They're two lucky, lucky guys. Yes. But relative to what we were doing when the ship picked them up, Trillian punched up the figures. They showed two to the power of infinity minus one to one against an irrational number that only has a conventional meaning in improbability physics. It's pretty low, continued Zaphod with a slight whistle. Yes, agreed Trillian, and looked at him quizzically. There's one big whack of improbability to be accounted for. Something pretty improbable has got to show up on the balance sheet if it's all going to add up to a pretty sum. Zaphod scribbled a few sums, crossed them out, and threw the pencil away. Bats, dose, I can't work it out. Well... Zaphod knocked his two heads together in irritation and gritted his teeth. Okay, he said. Computer! The voice circuit sprang to life again. 
Why, hello there, they said, ticker tape, ticker tape. All I want to do is make your day nicer and nicer and nicer. Yeah, well, shut up and work something out for me. Sure thing, chattered the computer. You want a probability forecast based on improbability data, yeah. Okay, the computer continued. Here's an interesting little notion. Did you realize that most people's lives are governed by telephone numbers? A pained look crawled across one of Zaphod's faces and onto the other one. Have you flipped, he said. No, but you will when I tell you that... Trillian gasped. She scrabbled at the buttons on the improbability flight path screen. Telephone number, she said. Did that thing say telephone number? Numbers flashed up on the screen. The computer had paused politely, but now it continued. What I was about to say was that... Don't bother, please, said Trillian. Look, what is this? said Zaphod. I don't know, said Trillian. But those aliens... They're on the way up to the bridge with that wretched robot. Can we pick them up on any of the monitor cameras? And there we go. That's our section for today. Recorded with the audio this time. So <laughs> hopefully I won't have to revisit it again. And uh, I hope that you uh, all out there are enjoying it. I know I am. I, I love this book so much. So um, I will be back tomorrow now that I've fixed this whole business. And we shall continue with the, uh, with the next little section. So everybody stay safe, stay healthy, stay inside. I'll be back tomorrow. Good night, everyone.